August 8th meeting of the West Memphis Utility Commission order. The first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. You receive them in your packet. So moved. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Smith. Second. Who seconded that? Uh, Ms. Brown, I heard her on this side. Good leader. Uh, second from Ms. Brown. Any additions or deletions? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? The minutes are approved. Second item on the agenda is the July safety report. Good morning. Good morning. Hopefully, Brett's last safety report. Oh, really? We're going to be interviewing for our new safety and training director. Oh. So, hopefully, by the time we have the next commission meeting, we'll have somebody else. Up there. Yeah. All right, so I think last month I reported we had had an injury in the first part of July, so that started to counter back over we're 34 days for a lost time injury and for the last reportable we have the one injury here today uh, july's incident rates is 2.4 and then with the additional 3360 hours we are up to today it brings it down to a 2 .4. so no injuries and Time work to continue to go back. And then, like we do every summer, we're, we're still just hammering on hydration and, and trying to protect from people related illnesses. So, July's safety meeting was full of water. And just some interesting facts uh, that our bodies comprise of 60% of water. And if the lack of water is one of the biggest number one trigger for daytime fatigue, and two percent drop in your water level can bring on short-term memory, but that's also the right when you begin to be dehydrated. You lose about two percent. That's dehydration um, it Cleanses our body of toxins, regulates our cooling system, which is the main important thing. There, we have to stay hydrated be able to keep your body cool if you don't get into that heat stress related illness. Um, some hydration tips. Uh, we talked about this many times and it's still kind of when you think about it, we probably all don't drink enough water and you need to be drinking a minimum of about 64 ounces of water a day just to stay hydrated. That's three or four water bottles at least that you need to drink a day. Um, and don't wait till you're thirsty because it's too late. You've got to stay on top of it. Uh, and then your sodas and coffee and all that are diuretics and you steal hydration from your body. So you kind of need to stay away from those. We've had some extreme heat, luckily. We've got a little cool spell going on. And we, we've been lucky throughout the summer so far. We've just got a little bit left to go, and I think we're being clear. Our employees and out here in the extreme heat. So we've done a good job up to this point. That's all I have. Thank you. Anybody got any questions? Thank you, sir. <coughs> Next item on the agenda is the financial report. I knew I was here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So um, our July revenues for the electric department, we came out to 3.1 million. For water, we had 346,000. Uh, for our sewer department, we had 293,000. Uh, as far as our July expenses for our normal department accounts, we came out to a total of 1.1 million. And for our depreciation accounts, we have a total of $592,000. So um, our total overall expenses up until this point, we are looking at $12,302,000. Uh, 
$504.06. Total revenue for the year is up to $20,237,791.23. Our other income comes out to $300,336.99, leaving us with a profit of $8,235,588.16. Any questions? The one thing I would like to point out, if you look at the June numbers, so our water rate increase went into effect on June 1st, right? So you can see the impact that the new water rates had on our revenues for water, right? So from the May numbers, it was 202,000, and the June numbers are 315,000. Um, why that's relevant is if you look down at the expenses, Right, so our, we weren't covering our water expenses with our water rates. So basically our electric department was subsidizing our water and wastewater department. So we're more in line now with where we need to be. So if you combine the water and the wastewater, because some of those charges are they're, they're combined between the two departments, so you really look at them both, and then you look at the water and the, and the total sewer numbers, that, that department is now self-sufficient now. So our rates are at least where we need to be to cover our expenses. So it's our second month into the new rate increase. We still have customers not overly happy with some of the... We're going to talk today about some changes that we'd like to make with our rate structure, um, which is going to lead to us, you know, once this commission approves some of the recommendations, then we'll be in front of city council getting the ordinances updated and changed to reflect the the changes that we'd like to make in our rate structure to make it a little bit more fair for some of our customers um, in terms of uh, rates, but it, it's it's a salient detail that we're, we're covering our expenses now, where we weren't doing that before. I have one question. Sure. I know this has been explained to them before. We've got 346,000 water sales. Uh, sewers are 293,000 and sewer is 132 percent of water. Are oh, those figures closer or sewer larger? Um, so for the biggest reason is that on the irrigation meters, okay. meters that don't put anything back into the wastewater system, we don't charge a sewer okay. charge on those. And so especially this time of year, irrigation usage is going to go up, but there won't be a sewer charge associated with the irrigation. We're also on summer sewer average for July. I'm sorry. We're also on summer sewer average for July, where you use eight winter months for your sewer, not not 132 percent. For June, July, August, and September, it's not 132 percent. It's the average of the eight winter. <laughs> okay. Anybody got any questions about the financial? Uh, well, before we move off the financial, is there any other things that, as commission that you would like to see in the, in the financial report each month? Are you happy with this the way it is, or is there is there more information that you would like? Or I would like to see just a single page being out. A profit and loss statement. Yeah. But this is fine. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, the next item on the agenda is the AMI update. Thank you. I'm just forewarning you today, it's mostly going to be the Mario show. That's okay. Give her time. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Uh, AMI monthly update. Uh, the completed as of August 2024. 12,108 electric devices installed and 8,408 water devices installed. We probably have. 200, 250 water meters left. Um, we've taken some of the used, the, the water meters that were out there in 
programmed a little differently because of how we breed in hundreds or we bill in hundreds. We had those pulled out, put new ones in, and we've gone through reprogrammed those so we can repurpose those out in the field. So it gives the contractors a few more meters that they can be changed out for us before it's handed completely over to us. But we are almost, I would say, 100% complete on all three quarter inch and one inch, but we've put in everything that we bought with the grant money. And uh, we're getting really, really close. It's cut down, for instance, we read one billing cycle yesterday. It was approximately 75 meters that we had to manually root. Uh, and those are some, the two inch or better water meters, the bigger water meters that some of the commercial account. And uh, it's just it's moving right along and getting good reads, less estimations, which is amazing for us and the customers, getting accurate bills. Yeah, the estimations are the biggest thing. I think last month I had what age quarter of estimation. At one point in time it was 40. 41, 44. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, that's huge. And the AMI is going to enable the next things that we're talking about. So. Yes, sir. Okay, any questions? Other questions? Okay, the next item is. CIS presentation. All right. <laughs> Morning, everybody. How are you all doing today? All right. You need to move that over here. <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> you know me. You know me. I, 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 <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, my name is uh, is Greg Johnson. And uh, I'm here to talk about the customer information and billing system that we've been investigating for the oh, better part of this year, for all of this year, as a matter of fact. And, um, what I'm going to talk about is, is just a little bit of background of who I am, just to make sure you have a, a sense of that. It's actually presented to some of you before in the past. I'll talk about the CIS and billing system, what it is, and what we, uh, we see with the benefits, and then talk about the steps we've gone through over this past year in investigating and searching for the, the new platform and the results and the recommendation that we'll have for it. And please, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Just stop me and ask as we go. Uh, I'm with a company called Katama Technologies, KTI. We've been working in the industry for over 20 years. We're connected through uh, Public Power's hometown connections. We have a relationship with them. We also work with the NRACA, as a matter of fact, as it turns out. And we do strategic technology planning for the utilities in this area. And we work throughout the United States. We don't have any geographic limitations. And we've worked here at West Memphis in the past, both on the origination of the AMI project and more recently on a the uh, finance and accounting application that's been acquired that's been close to being finished right at this point. I don't think it's cut over Not yet. soon, close. but it's right around the, the beginning of that time. So we've enjoyed our time working here and, and we appreciate all the time we've been able to spend. What we're looking at is a customer information and billing system. But currently you're operating with a legacy system that you've created and it's worked very well over the years. It's been a, a stalwart, but now that you've put AMI in and now that you've got some other things going, and frankly we've got a whole lot more, you know, smartphones and all kinds of other technologies, it, it needs to, you know, you need to be able to do more things and the new systems that, that you have are going to be able to enable your customers to do a lot more self-service. Um, so they're going to be able to, to, to get alarms set to themselves, get high bill notifications early. They're going to have a lot of capabilities to, to do more with their own usage of electric and water. Your, as an organization, are going to be able to do a much more efficient process, batching disconnects and, and processing things more quickly. You're going to have um, better responses to, to outages, to service order needs. So these systems that you have, the AMI and the new customer information system, are going to be tightly linked, integrated, 
to a lot of, allow a lot more efficiency internally and a lot more benefits to the customers. And totally, you'll be able to do a lot more new rates that are going to be discussed here a little bit too. So this will enable that. So there's a lot of good reasons to do this. <laughs> What we've done to, to do the investigation, we started actually late last year, and we wrote requirements documentation, publicized that, released that to the, to the industry, and we had five uh, companies respond to us with their offers for this system. We reviewed those offers, and for a variety of reasons, three of those players dropped off, and we ended up focusing on uh, NISC and Spry Point, we'll talk about those guys in a second. And so recently we've gone through confirming all their prices, ensuring the functional delivery of what they had, and talking to a lot of reference accounts to understand what do they do, how do they do it. And we've gone back and forth on itself, internally looking at, well, how do we make this work with each of these people and, and new things? Because this, these systems are going to have to take a lot of data from AMI, from your G or from your uh, mapping system, from a lot of things. So it's it's really got to work well. It's it's not like it's just you plop it, but turn it on and it goes. You've got to co uh, coordinate the entry with the other systems. And so we've been doing a lot of that research, and we'll be here to talk now about what we found. And on the technical evaluation, we found of uh, these two companies that. Spry Point had a little better technical responsiveness to what we wanted to do. Um, they had the generally the greatest compliance with our technical requirements. They also offered a few more things than NISC, uh, notably black backflow, and I'll talk about that in a minute. They also um, allowed us to, re to continue to use one of our other key applications associated with AMI. And their ability to integrate with all these other applications we're putting in is a little bit better. And we also had a lot better response on their, their references when we talked to them over the time. Financially, these are all 10-year numbers, so make sure you understand this is not a, a check you're writing, but these are costs that are ass assessed over a 10-year period. And you can see NIC is a little bit more expensive not a ton, but, but notable. I mean, it's clear what it is. But in the case of Spry Point, we have to use or continue to reuse one of our existing applications, the meter data management application, which was just put in. So it's a brand new, uh, functionally rich application. But Spry Point does have a lower total cost of ownership, as well as being a more technically compli compliant entity. And um, we've evaluated them with a, a better strength. And we also see in the case of, of um, Spry Point that they have a backflow tool. And the, uh, in the backflow, code enforcement is going to have to be getting more involved or is going to be getting more involved with backflow. And Spry Point has a capability that we can just blend right in. So that was another strength on their side. So at the end of the day, they had. Um, better technical response, a better financial response. And when we did our evaluation of references, we found some things better too. And I just have this slide here just to give you a slight indication. These orange colored boxes are what we actually are acquiring and implementing through this Spry Point system. These other color, the bluish color, or tan, whatever, whatever that what color is that? Anybody? It looks light blue back here. Light blue, light blue back here, okay. So these are your AMI system. This is your existing mapping system. This is your brand new finance and accounting system. Uh, your, your IVR, your phone system. And then the Spry Point system is going to fit in everywhere here. And it will have both an internal billing and finance um, management application for your customers but it will also have these portals and we will have prepay metering capable and we will have a portal that the users can go out, program and do that self-service I talked about earlier. And so that's all of what they have to come in and put in. And so it's a complicated system. It'll take about 18 months, 
marginally, depending upon how long the contract negotiations talk and when we actually start the implementation. But once we do, we do recommend it's probably point, <clears throat> once the contract signed, it would be about 15 months, and we're just giving it about a couple of months for contract negotiations. And assuming you, you approve this today, then we'll move forward with those contract negotiations. And I did want to mention one other thing, that when we did our reference reviews, in parallel, Conway Corporation was doing the same assessment. So they are a reference of spry points, but they ended up selecting the same solution. So we do have a, a local friend, if you will, that's in the same process. But we're recommending strongly to go ahead with, with spry point and um, to start the contract negotiations negotiations as soon as we possibly can if, if you approve. Anybody else want to add anything? Mario? No, sir. Bob? Yeah, I would just say that you know this, this is a the, the, the biggest reason that we're doing this project right, is for benefit of our customers. It's going to dramatically increase customer functionality, give customers better options. Um, there'll be options that customers have been asking for for a long time, like localized billing, things like that that we don't currently offer. And this opens up a whole plethora of opportunity for our customers to interact with us in a more positive way. So it's it's really a uh, uh, there's a lot of benefits to the system, and like like Greg said, Sprite Point does a much better job interfacing with all of our existing systems. That was one of the things I specifically had concerns with. I'm familiar with the NISC system. I've used that in my previous life, and it's a good system. Um, but they're they're wholly integrated in that they won't really interface. You have to buy their stuff for the other systems, right? So when you start looking at changing the MDM, the meter data management system, and the customer information system, and the AMI system, you kind of get it up to a little bit of change fatigue for the organization, and, and the ability to have some of our legacy systems in place, and then interface with them with the new system is hugely appealing because it's gonna, it's gonna speed up our implementation process, and it's going to lead to a lot less functional errors that we have to correct after the fact. Both of these systems are hosted in, in that it's kind of an out-of-the-box solution, so there's not a lot of customization to it. So then when it breaks, okay, when it breaks or we have a problem with it, they fix it. Right? We don't have to do that internally. So they're going to manage that system and they're going to... It's the same everywhere they have it. Yep. So that's a, that's a huge benefit from that system as well. Yeah, there are no customs in this solution. There, there's configurations, but no custom code. How, how many, obviously, I don't have a lot of experience. I've never heard the name before today. Mm -hmm. How big a company is this? How many clients do they have? Spry Point is um, a newer company. They've been around since 2010, 20, 2009, 2010, and they have, um, they're Canadian based, they are based in the eastern part of Canada. Um, they've got, I believe at this point, 50-ish customers that they've signed up with, that, that they've delivered or are delivering systems to. So they're, they're newer, um, they have created their capability within the last seven or eight years and um, it's one where the, the good news of that is that the technology is more current in terms of the you know the, the basic capability of integrating my company we work with spry point and NISC and we've recommended both of them for different places but this is the third time that we've selected side spry point with a, another entity like yourselves and they've delivered well in the places they've gone so far but they've got about 50 customers and so they're they're relatively you know, new in that so you mentioned conway how poor are they on their implementation well they've just decided as well so they're a little bit ahead of us but um you think that's going to affect the timeliness of our implementation after we do it once no i don't i don't think so that that's not um, neither of the systems are huge. 
uh, for what we're talking about. We we are working with them with another utility that is maybe three, four times as big as you. Um, and they had similar concerns, you know, because Spry Point is growing. They're kind of the, right. the shiny tool on the block. So they have been able to staff up and support it. All of their people come from uh, the industry. I mean, they're relatively well known. They're employees within the industry, but they are staffing up with their people. So it's not as if this is a risk free, you know, it's just going to fly off the shelf. Now, we do have um, some experience with them, though, and seeing what they've done. And we, we would have to put into the, the contract negotiations uh, close attention to that statement of work and, and the supporting roles and how we do that. But, uh, you know, I, I'm never sitting here saying that this is an absolute can't miss. Um, these are the strongest players in the industry right now. And there's going to be risk. And there's going to be some some hiccups, but they are the ones that I think have the strength to get it done and to do the right thing. And you know, with the other alternative, NISC, they're going through a transition right now because they've got a legacy capability that they're having to get rid of because it's older and dated, and so they're having some troubles with that. So neither one is going to be you know absolutely without without that risk. But I believe you've you've got a strong capability with that. Thank you. The, the other thing is Sprite Point tends to work more with municipals where NISC tends to work more with cooperatives. So Sprite Point's a little bit more in line with our business model. So I think that's a positive as well. Yep, they, they do. And they, they have more capability for, well, like fiber. I mean, fiber is certainly a part of what they deliver um, with a little bit greater capability than, than with NISC. NISC has some, but not that much because of exactly that point with the municipal coverage. Got some questions right off on Is this like a cloud base? Yes. That's yeah. why they take care if something goes wrong. That's right. This is okay. going to be a cloud-based solution. We don't have a bit of hardware. No. Okay. Very little hardware, if any. Then we use the customer's hardware. Then the backflow, that's the ability to go back in our old records? No, uh, the, the backflow is um, the ability, it's a, it's a water quality testing and a protection against backflow coming from a customer into the system. Okay. And so we're, we're monitoring that capability and NISC doesn't have that at all. Uh, so we would have had to have laid out a third party, but it's it's really a, a water quality and secu security, if I can call it that, uh, of the water itself, the water flow. And then the last item up here, payment processing application. That's a package that will be had to be integrated with us and them. Yep, yeah, it's it's so. <clears throat> um, there are companies out there that have, because of personal identifiable information, PII, or you know, the credit card foundation, or the credit card uh, backbone, there are companies that specialize in that, and protecting that information and making it efficient. And so that's something neither NISC nor Spry Point offer. But it is something we need to be able to support the types of payments people want to do now. People still want to pay cash. They want to pay with their phone, with Google Pay or Apple Pay. They want to pay with credit card over the phone or on the internet. And there are payment processing companies that need to do that and to keep that secure and functionally rich for the people to do it where you want them to pay it. You know, with Gene Stimson, Steen, Stinson's? Stimson. Stimson's and so forth. So it's, it's that kind of payment. Our current payment, Terry and Dion will tell you, it causes us lots of problems. When folks pay online, um, you know, it sometimes you know, like, it works. And well, it, it works, but sometimes the data doesn't transfer over in time before we disconnect them. There, there's there's lots of problems. Oh, the website is not working. Yeah. So this this payment processing system is going to be it's going to be critical for us. 
in, in the so we're ready to make that. You know, yeah. Yeah. We, are, we are. Okay. Yeah, and it will be a parallel. And the, it's not an expensive system. You know, the, it has an ongoing cost, which all of them do, but it's, it's really not an expensive system to, to apply. And the other thing is, per Bob's point, was with this prepay capability and the AMI disconnect, you want that data to flow so somebody pays their bill, they don't call you to get reconnected again. I mean, it just happens, and so it needs to be done efficiently. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's one of the things about this system that's really nice. So if we disconnect somebody for non-pay, when they make the payment, the system will automatically cut them off. We don't have to do anything. So that, you know, right now, um, we have folks that they, they, uh, they'll pay if it's on a weekend, right? It's, we, somebody has to actually manually do that. And usually that's Maria. Um, and, and so now the system will take care of all that. And it's really gonna help with our efficiencies and, and our customer service. Our customer service. Sure, y'all understand. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned now we're dealing with a uh, two companies that you looked at and you recommended one who. Now, uh, dealing, dealing with what we're going through now, we're changing a legacy system, what we're dealing with right now. Now, we're going with another company. Now, we realize all of this happens with a big company. There has to be a party to come in to host the system. Now, does TriPoint do in-house hosting? Is it contracting out? Or is it a third party involved? Or do you know that? They have a third party um, hosting entity that they use for that. I don't have much fa uh, much of the data about that right now, but that, that'll be part of the negotiations of where that data is going to reside. Would we be privy to that to know who's the hosting? A lot of times yes. when you, you get into hosting, you know, that's one of your biggest deals because <coughs> now you're dealing with a company but then you're dealing with a third party. Now, a lot of times to show you how we can get caught up in a trap there, a third party, a lot of times, will not deal with legacy equipment at all, okay? Right. Therefore, we can get into an agreement with this company, but their third party doesn't accept something that we got on the back end, which now we enter into a contract with a company not knowing who are hosting, in-house hosting, and what type of a deal. Because a lot of companies would get that, and I've heard you mention that they've got about 50 people on board. Well, maybe we can get a chance to look at and see who's hosting, what's going on with that. Because a lot of times, everybody now in these cutovers now is having problems with hosting. Everybody now is contracting out hosting. And we don't want to get into a spot that we're finished. Now we can look out here and see what the problem that the other utilities and the other people that have cut over to the system has. We don't want to get into that because, see, right now the city is, is involved with several platforms. We're trying to uh, cut over from one system into another one. We're trying to select vendors. But at the same time, the city is trying to employ five. Now, if you realize now, when the city, when we agreed as a commission to go into a fiber contract to deploy fiber, you know, grant come in and all that, and we got that. Now we're starting in that. We're going to see down the road that we can create problems now because now, while we're doing the fiber, the city has to contract with someone to host, which we have one venue. We allow to get into this contract, and who to say the company that we're already dealing with now that's hosting our fiber won't deal with this other third party. Now we're in a trap where we've got to stick with where we're at. So we got to make sure that there's a smooth, this here, this, these products here can be not bumpy roads. These can be real bumpy roads that can really cost us down the road some pretty good money because now we can dump everything we got into the fiber. The city, we're deploying fiber all over the city at a humongous cost. We're looking to 
revamp our money, get back into what we put in the project, minus what the federal government, what they give us to start this project. We can't get it deployed right now. It's they study running out. Now we're going to get into a situation when we deal with that. Competitors. There's all type of competition that's going to come in here and deal with us on the file. We, we said as a commission that we're going to sit here and come in here and we're going to offer internet for $30 a month. Who's to say one of the other big tech contractors coming in and say, hey, we're going to give for $20 a month. Now, it knocks us back. So we got to get a pretty good look at it. I know that's something down the road, but we got to make sure when we make these decisions <coughs> on these companies, we need to know not the not front of that. That's just like bring a guy in and hire him for a job and then find out this and this and this about him later on. We need to know up front because this is not a, this here is not a, a, a little old drop in the bucket. This is something that if we're not careful with this, down the road, it may be 10 steps involved. We may get down to step seven, cost us a ton of money to go to step eight, and now we got the bag up. So I think it's something that we really have to look yeah, at. Yeah, well, um, I don't know who they use for their hosting. I, I just honestly don't know. Mari, I assume you don't either, but I... Um, I, I but, can't remember, I know something. I can't remember what was in the, the slides or what was asked. I, it may have been Amazon, but I am not 100% sure. I thought it was that AWS was, too. Yeah. But once once somebody starts to host, is that a finite contract or does that go on forever? What happens if the contract that, runs out? Of that's it? that's what I was going to say to somebody so else. No, and they to say, well, to no. Mr. Felton's point, these are all these are all things that we have to worry about in that contract negotiation. Right. Right. So when we get so. Now we're going to select which vendor we want to begin negotiations with. Once we begin those negotiations, those are exactly the things that we need to right. talk about and make sure that we have covered in, in contractual language so that we're not on the hook or we're not out for additional costs up front. So that's what, what Greg was talking about. So that's that three month period where we enter into those contract negotiations to figure out exactly what it is that we need, what we want. So once we develop that statement of work, then we'll be going back and looking at things like, okay, who's going to be hosting this? How they interface? How they? All the things that Commissioner Felton talked about. We'll put those in the contract to make sure that we're covered. And there's a couple of things about that that we need to check because there's there's privacy issues across the border that we have to be careful with, and, and we've had some negotiations with Spry Point with another utility that had issues with Canada. And so there's that issue. It's not easy to, I mean, if you develop things for AWS or for Azure or whatever environment, it's not easy to switch to them. I mean, it, for us, it, it's mostly transparent. I mean, it, it quite honestly, it's mostly transparent. The only areas where you get into some challenges is that AWS, which is Amazon, just like Amazon that we buy from, Amazon Web Services, and Microsoft has an equivalent cloud called Azure, and so Microsoft has some certain tools that they use for, for managing their cloud services and AWS has a different set of tools. So how SpryPoint or NISC use those tools makes it hard for them to ship. But for the most part, it's transparent as to who can interface to them to pull data to and from. So I don't think we have that issue, but they could use a third, a smaller, you know, player that is a problem. So it's, it, we have to check, and you're, just, you're right. Just like you mentioned uh, Microsoft. Yep. You mentioned AWS. Each has their own priorities. Yep. Now, not only are they prioritized, but also they don't deal with other contracts, especially in an area like we talk about. You talk about outside the US, when you go into Canada, they won't interface. They won't allow you to touch the equipment. They won't hook into yours. You cannot use theirs. Now, that's when they get into the problem where now everybody trying to work around the system, even if, if we find out, just say we find out now that this comes to, hey, we got 50 new contracts, we can get in, in here. But we got to move our subsidiary somewhere into the US in order for us to deal with it. 
and, and that's costly to them. Yep. But then that makes our rate. I'll, I'll ask it all the time. Everybody in here, if you're not careful, just like we got people coming in here now with the water, saying that we're sticking it to them. When we get involved with that, we're going to be hauling down the line. They sticking it to us. <laughs> we're going to be in the same situation. If we're not, we have to be real, yep. real careful and, and, and deal with it. And th that is a, an important point for and me. Most of it, it, it's a, it's, it's almost if, if you deal, it's almost a hidden agenda with them when it comes to that point. But if you ask them up front, they has to answer. You. Yep. But if you don't ask, they will not tell no, you. They have, yep. So they get you down the road, ink, ink, ink. They got you inked in, and you can't bag up. And they say you can bag up. Well, we got a five-year contract. We have got a ten-year contract. You got to honor that contract to the end. So we got to make sure we put our issues on the dotted line that we know exactly what we're what we're getting into. Fair enough. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Any problems? <laughs> it, it does, but. The, the solutions that it offers far outweigh oh, the problems for sure. Until um, I get down. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> anybody else have comments, questions? Yes, you would uh, yeah. vote to approve right point as our as our vendor okay. that we will that we can enter into contest. Is, is that without? Without some of the things to do with that we don't know about them. So this just enables us to to proceed into contract negotiations. Well, we're just proceeding in the contract, and we find out some other things we're not locked in. We're not, we're not locked in at all. Okay. Yeah, this is just enabling the utility to its selection of the vendor, and then enabling us to begin those <coughs> conversations about contract. And what will happen after this then is that we'd, we'd start the negotiations and we'd have really a two-pronged approach to that. Um, there's the, the legal ease approach. I mean, there's the, your lawyer is going to have to get involved to, to understand that contract language, talk about some of these issues, and then there's also the statement of work and the flow of what's going to happen and what's being delivered and how. So there's a technical and a legal piece of this and some of it crosses over into the areas that you're identifying right now and that's where we'll have to be coordinated but then I assume we'd come back that here's the the contract and your lawyer would be here and to actually move forward that we work together on the AMI so yeah so when we get to the point where we're ready to sign the contract, we'll be back in front of you guys and we'll be talking about, okay, this is the contract that we have, and this is what we want to do, and we'll be really transparent about that. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. 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 We have a motion of Mr. Burns, second of Mr. Holmes. Any further questions, statements, comments? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you for your Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Very enlightening. Tell the flavor of the Okay. Next item is. Uh, the meter connections and disconnect charges. Based on Mrs. Robertson being here last time, 
um, and issue is in front of city council. So these are the recommendations to resolve some of the issues that we're having. We talked about how some of some of our business practices that are based working ordinance probably aren't totally fair to our customers right now. We want to change some of those things, and that's what we're about to talk about. Now. Okay, as of right now, there's uh, some people are upset about we're going out pulling the meters on your irrigation because they don't want to pay the minimum charges on the irrigation systems or, or what have you. So, if someone was to, there's already a tap made. So, Bob talked about, I think, last commission meeting right now to go out and set a meter, it's a $700 charge because we don't really have anything else uh, it's just that tap fee seven hundred dollars so this is what we're proposing uh, as connection and disconnection charges is for instance a three quarter residential meter which is a lot of what our citizens already have 125 dollars and this is going to take you know we've got labor that's going on we've got parts or gaskets and stuff and other that we've got to you know, also use put things in um, it may be uh, if the box is, is gone or, or different things um, the three quarter inch commercial uh, you have there's $150 um, and as these meters get bigger for bigger services it takes more people um, more parts flanges things of that nature it's going to have to also be installed yes sir um, so this is just pricing by what size meter or tap is already there um, and to take care of that expense to, to us. So, I'm sorry to interrupt, just to be clear, this is not established. I moved into a house, I call up to have you get my water electricity turned on. This is to actually put a meter in a place where there is not previously. This is correct. It is an installation of a meter that is not previously. So, so one of the challenges that we're having is, is the, there's a minimum meter charge, right? And if folks don't have any usage, a lot of times they don't want to pay the minimum meter charge. And the position of the utility is, is that the service is available, right? We've treated water, we've maintained the pipeline, it's there, it's available. So that's the whole purpose. There, there's some cost with the MI. The MI meters are about four times the cost what the old ones were. And so there's a lot of costs associated with that, and so we provided all that, and it's available for a customer. So that's the whole point of the minimum meter charge. If they're not using it, so you got to pay the minimum. However, if you if you don't want to use it, well, we're happy to go take it out. But a lot of folks were resistant to do that because what Mara said to get it put back in, it was seven hundred dollars, right? And so this this is a way to make that a lot more fair to the customers. That hey, if you don't want to use your irrigation. I understand that. We can take the meter out, and then if you ever want to put it back in, if you've got a three quarter line, it'll cost $125. And all that really does is cover our cost to go out and put the meter in. So, what, what we don't want to do, right, is we don't want somebody continually connecting, disconnecting, connecting, disconnecting, and having the rest of the rate payers subsidize that activity, right? And so, if you have somebody that's doing that, we want them, it, it's for their benefit or their desire, and we want them to incur those costs, not spread them out to the rest of our rate payers that aren't really engaging in that. Okay. Well, and, and this, the other thing too, doesn't, and, and probably does to some extent, but you say it covers your cost. If your costs go up, the rate stays the same until we have another vote to change it. So well, this has to go into the future for a while as well. Exactly, and so what meter what, prices go up? And, uh, so, so our rates are established by ordinance, right? And, and what we will do is after if, if the commission approves this, then the next thing will be to go in and update the ordinance and get city council to approve the ordinances. Then when we go as costs go up, we need to adjust our these these costs or our rates or whatever. Then that'll just be you know we'll have a discussion here again. We'll ask for approval from the commission, and then we'll do the same thing. We'll update the ordinance, and that's what we we'll do. So it'll go through that same process regardless of what's happening. Okay, I see the cost for the the person who owns whatever it is to have the meter um, installed. What is the cost to us to uh, 
discontinued that. To, 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 did to, you say you had to take to it out, cut it off? I'm sorry? Should be none. So we're not going to be pulling it up out once they hit place. Well, it, 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 it. Under some circumstances, already in policy, if vacant for over a year, uh, or a house has burned down, a lot has, you know, dip, been demoed or whatever else. In certain situations, we do remove the meters. Uh, that way, they're they're now out there, and you know, we can also repurpose them and reuse right. them. You're pulling out a, a house burn, a vacant lot, a house vacant over a year that burned down. We as the city goes out and remove that meter. Who do you charge? We don't charge. It's, it's vacant. There's not an it's not an account. Yeah, so we don't charge. There's no charge. Well, I was looking at. You got to pay one hundred twenty-five dollars to get it taken out, and then one hundred twenty-five dollars to put it back. No, it's not. Oh, to, to put it in because you have a meter expense to put it in. Right. Take it out, you don't have a meter expense. Okay. So it's just yeah. But it's also mitigation for potential damage because you got more meters out there. Something could happen to it. So they go pull the meter, tap the line, so nobody can. But but doesn't the the this is, we already talked about that. We already talked about this city does have a, 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 a system, right? That yeah. tracks all the addresses, correct? If a house burnt, if a meter is already there in our records assigned to that address, why would we even pull it out, period, when the possibility of a person rebuilding on their property, your water meter, and everything's already there? Of course, there's no profit. When they come in and turn it back on, they pay the fee for it. So, so what happens a lot is currently right now, right? Mars going to talk next about meter tampering charges, right? And we have a lot of problems with folks accessing our water meters, and where they can turn it on is at that meter, right? To your point, if there's nobody there, right? Somebody turns it on and they're using water. It's going to take us a month to find out, depending on how they how they do that, and and so the reason that we take that out, we don't take the tap off of the main, but we'll take the meter out and cap it, and then when somebody it, it's it's a point where we don't have a leak, it's just protecting that infrastructure. It prevents tampering, it prevents theft, it prevents all of those things. It gives us an opportunity to bring the meter back in, and Mari can calibrate it. We can reinstall it someplace else. I mean, I, I don't want to have a $500 piece of equipment just sitting out there not being used in perpetuity. I would much rather pull that out of the field, bring it in, recalibrate it, and reinstall it someplace else until we need it at that location. We're still going to have to go out there to, to hook it up when somebody reapplies for service. But why, why that look like that's going to be a thing of the past if your AMI goes into that? Well, and, but you've got a meter. For electric, the water, we can't remote disconnect water on an AMI meter. Correct. So the tampering is only electric. But tampering is the water. Okay, that's, that's the thing is, you just said if <laughs> someone goes out and connect to a meter and use water illegally. Well, if, see, it gets us back to what Ms. Robinson coming in and complained about. The complaint was, not more like Leslie, we have to change the basic rate for the media, but her biggest problem was usage. So we got, uh, we, we're looking at usage. Here's a customer paying now for a meter that's in place with a base meter charge. And the sewer rate is 125% of that. Now, back to the point, here's a customer paying, that's got a meter sitting out there. That's just paying thirty, forty dollars a month. So but I'm not to get to that. Now the tampering part that I'm talking about that we don't have to go out and send employees, spend labor to do that. If AMI there, you know that in your system that this meter is vacant at a vacant location. When you see a flow on it, that's time for you to go check. Very true. Should take us months and months to go find but it. We've also had many, many lots and places within West Memphis that, is, that have been vacant or unused accounts since 2012. 
2008, 2006. So we've got equipment that we could be using somewhere else instead of buying new equipment that we can repurpose and not have that cost to move to where we actually need it and are collecting some type of you know okay. in the, money for it. In the meter, you, you described here earlier that we have about 250 water meters. My question to you is now on these vacant lots, on these vacant meters, on these dilapidated structures, there's a meat out there. Did we as a city go replace those old meters with the new ones? No, sir. With the contractors, if it was a burnt down house, an empty lot, you know, in a lot of circumstances, if it was, then they should not have changed out the meter. We have found some that we're going back through that they did change out the meter, but if it has been vacant for over a year or two years, then we are going out and pulling that meter out back out of the system and tapping the main that way. You know, because you just never know. I mean, we even have still have some houses out there. There is no electricity. There is no water. It is not an active account. Um, but either way, if it has been vacant over a year, it's got to go through electrical inspections for code. It has to go through water plumbing inspections for code, uh, through banking for its own inspections. So it's just repurposing our equipment, not having to keep buying more and more and more when we've got equipment out there that's not being used. Uh, my question um, concerning um, the customer that came last month has to do with apartments or whatever housing that's not um, rented out periodically. I know we are looking at the vacant lots, we need to remove those or whatever. Will that rate stay the same? Are we seeing the cost? You know, there's a cost to them when when it's when it's not used. There's a minimum cost, and that that was her concern. But yeah. what is the cost to us versus the cost to her or to them if we dis discontinue the cost, the charge? Before I answer that question, can we let Mario finish talking about oh. all her points? <laughs> Sorry. So, no, 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 no. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a fair question. Yes. I just wanted to give her, she may address it, is why I'm saying it. So that was the cost for the installation if there is not a water meter there instead of charging a $700 tax fee. Also, with Ms. Robinson's request, they're coming in and speaking uh, last month, we, the minimum charge on an active account for a water meter, no matter if there's any usage or not, still will be charged. The sewer, speaking with Bob, we are not going to do a minimum charge for the sewer because we agree that if it, we don't have any usage on the water meter, there is nothing flowing into the sewer. So I spoke with Billy and we do have the capability of doing a do not bill on a water meter that is an active account that we will charge a minimum on the water meter, but we will not charge anything on the sewer. So what's this? I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. So both residential and commercial? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what, what we don't want to do, right? So the, the, whole, the whole point is, is, is if, the, if they're consuming services, right, the, the utility should be compensated for that, right? So if they have an active account, there's a water meter there, we've treated the water, it's available for use, right? They're not putting anything into the wastewater system, so Paul Holloway is not treating anything. We're not moving it through our lift stations. And so there's no adverse effect to the utility operations by that. But the service is still there and available. So in Mrs. Robertson's instance, I don't have the exact numbers, but the, the minimum charge was right around 10 bucks a month, it's, something like that. It was the sewer charge that was so, that's where the $40 a month came in with the sewer charge. So, you know, if there's a meter out there and it's it's available that's where the minimum charge comes in but 
if there's no usage, then we're not going to charge the sewer charge. So that would address all of those issues, right? And that, that that's that's fair to everyone, right? But to and I do understand your your concerns, Commissioner Felton. But we're having a lot of issues. Mario's team's having a lot of issues with folks. There's been an ongoing. We've been pretty lax as a utility allowing folks to get in and out of our water meters and turn off, turn off, turn off, turn on our water meters. Um, you, you can drive down and, and see places where folks will hook up to our fire hydrants and just unmeter take water. And there's, there's, so we're trying to get on top of that and, and, and <coughs> removing meters that aren't in use. That's pretty much industry standard that happens across the industry. That was one of the things that I've really advocated since I've been here. And what it does is it helps us better be able to control that service that we provide, what's going out of our system, and what you know, and, and what people are paying for and not paying for. How does it affect the accuracy and integrity of the meter for it not being used? The um, sediment builds up and causes problems. And then when it gets, does get turned back on, it may be metering accurately I don't that probably be a better question that's more technical question for Maria I would say that there's probably for it not being used there's there's definitely opportunity for sediment and, and contaminants to, to be in the meter not being used hooked up versus not being used on the shelf I guess would be well pressure. it's not going to sit on the shelf right we're going to take it in we're going to calibrate it and we're going to reuse it someplace else well, versus going out and buying more that was kind of my point too is I noticed Years ago, I had some meters changed and usage changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. And it was because probably the meter that was taken out was 40 years so old. Out of the, well, I mean, who knows? It's been a huge problem with our AMI deployment. Um, folks, you know, they, they'll, they'll come in and they're really upset because when we change to an AMI meter, all of a sudden their usage goes way up. And they're like, well, I've never used this before. And I'm like, I do understand. So we just put a new meter in that's electronic and it's calibrated. And so for all those years, considered a bonus, right? I mean, you were getting free <laughs> services. It sounds bad, but it's it's true. It's, it's true. true. It's not what you do. Me, it's electric and water. I've discussed my recent meter mm -hmm. problems at a leak. I didn't know until then I got into it that there's a sending unit or something on that lead to that meter and it goes down to the meter. <clears throat> Is there a lock on that lead that only the utility can access? You gotta be careful we, with that. We, we are investigating uh, some way of locking our leads down. The, the short answer is currently no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, I can see that lead. What, what happens if I can have a burst pipe in my house and then go turn the water off to keep from doing 30, 40, 50, You've got to cut off right outside so, of your house. Yes. But just like mine is under about three feet of dirt. So I go out to the meter and cut it off. But we go have people opening those meters and breaking that fire. That's already happened. It's yes. happened. It happens a lot. And even just the wire, the wire itself costs the utility $75 just to buy the wire. That's what that's the, that's the only place I have to turn the water off in my house. I know. Every time I go out of town, I turn the water off. But you, you, water gotta, you have to cut off somewhere. So, there, the, so by code, you should have to cut off someplace. So, so I'm going to need to find that. Yes. Sometimes it's next to the hot water heater. Sometimes it's under your kitchen sink. Sometimes well, it could be in a flower in bed. And that's the only guy's cover. I'll look harder. <laughs> you're scared. <laughs> I had a water leak one time while I was gone. Yeah, no, and so, and, but that's part of our problem, right, is we have folks going out there, and, and that's where we get into this, the tampering yeah. charts, and that's the thing that Mari's going to talk about. The majority of that is from folks doing exactly what you're saying, is they're going out, they're opening the meter box, and with this new AMI-sensitive electronic wow. equipment, it's not like the old stuff, and they're breaking it, and it's causing big problems for us. And so what we want to try to do is we want to, we want to get control over it, it's just like electric meters, right? Most folks wouldn't ever dream of going out and pulling an electric meter off the side of their house, but they'll go out and they'll do the same. They'll do whatever they can to a water meter. And, and, and for us, it's there's no difference, right? That, that meter belongs to the utility, and we don't like people messing with it because 
that's how we establish, I mean, that's when tampering occurs, that's when we establish how we establish what rate we're going to charge, right? And also, so. I mean, they, some people go in and, and turn the curves off the wrong way and broken it off the valve to a you know, water goes shooting out, so it's many things why we probably need to definitely mm -hmm. go this direction. I had no problem with doing that, so I Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> one's supposed to turn off my water, that's supposed to turn off my neighbor's water, and it's broken. <laughs> it happens. Okay. So continuing on, the meter, the meter tampering charges, uh, as of right now, we've got it as $50 in our policy. Would like to up that fee to $250. One, it may take, let's just say, one of my servicemen to truck roll out there because billing has sent us a work order saying um, this account is vacant, somebody's turned it back on, we need to go out there and see why it's showing consumption. So he goes out there and he checks everything, the water's turned back on. Now that we're missing the lid, the little piece that's connected to the lid is called an ERT. Um, the cord, like I say, it, from the box in the lid to the ERT to the lid kit that actually holds that ERT up inside the lid so it will transmit reads. And uh, everything would just be going on or missing except for the water meter. And uh, then in some cases, We've had some people that I don't know why. We have urge missing, just the cord missing. I can't tell you if it's the plumber or if it's the customer. Uh, we've had one, one particular apartment complex here recently that I ended up uh, having to call the landlord and say, hey, you've got a tenant that is carrying up our equipment. The account is in your name. Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to come talk to you because we don't know who that tenant is. And went and talked to his tenant. So far, not the wood, we have not had any more issues. But it was, sometimes we have to put an antenna on there. Um, if it's quite a bit of ways from an electric meter or there's a lot of vehicles around, because uh, these work by RF radio frequency, it might interfere with the, that radio frequency. And sometimes we have to put the antennas on there to be able to get a better read or continue the signal. They've taken those, tore those up, so we would like to implement a little bit more costly tampering fee, and then if they damage our equipment, be able to pass that on to the customer. Correct. It just gives us a vehicle to address some of the issues with the increased cost of the AMI metering. It's, 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 it, it's an ongoing problem. We just need to adjust it. Do you, do, you do know the new meters, the sending unit from the top of the meter down the plug to your earth, your core. You realize all those meters only have a six to eight inch core on it. Every time a customer goes out to turn their water off in the house, they're opening the meter up because everybody used to going in the meter and turn it off in the plumb. You realize when they jerk that top off, that little six inch core comes loose. So that it's about a foot to two yeah, it's long. Yeah, it's all the way Some of them are short. But mine, you can play the thing. Like, the foot. That's what well, I'm talking about. Some of the meters are a little bit longer than others. Okay, but also this one will go farther down. And then if we have an antenna on it, you're looking at another 10 foot, 10 foot, it's all the way down. Ultimately, where we want to get to is we don't want customers accessing the meter box at all. So, like Mario started this conversation talking about, or at some point in the conversation, talking about we're researching boxes that where we can actually lock that box and keep folks from accessing the meters. Right? So, it, it's going to be a process. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be something. But at the end of the day, that's where we want to get to, is where we don't have folks even, even touching on meters. As, as AMI evolves, as more and more systems come out, that equipment's going to get even more and more electronic and more and more sensitive, and it will be more and more susceptible to damage by folks that don't know what they're doing with it. So we want to do everything we can to keep them out of there. More questions? Anybody else? Okay. Mari, thank you. Can I ask you a question? 
uh, about the about the installs. You know, a lot of times coming from records, uh, a lot of people come in to do demos, mm -hmm. and we have to remove the all the electric, all the uh, wiring, and we have to move remove the water meters. So will this install fee be for like if they have to build a new house and because we removed the water meter, we still have to charge the person that's moving in that it, that new install because you know we used to just say oh please install because we know the tap is already there, so we still have to charge them that for that for the okay thank you. Okay, do I have a motion on the tampering fee? Increase it to two hundred and fifty dollars. Before we make now we're saying we're making these changes. That you said you're gonna go look at the board. So what we'll have to do is, is, is if you, uh, if the commission approves us to change, make these changes to the ordinances, then we'll make the changes to the ordinances, and then we'll go in front of city council and they'll approve the ordinance. Can we get a copy? Can we see a copy of the ordinance and see where all of this is going to fit in before we change? Because there may be other changes to the existing ordinance. We'll get a copy of the existing ordinance. Make all the changes at once, is that what you're saying? Yeah. You have some other I, we don't have to do that now, but I'm talking about before we did it. We need to look at it and know yeah. fully what we're doing, not to not to turn around and remake a change here and then something different changes in the ordinance that before we go to the city council, we have knowledge of what's going before we sit down. Absolutely. So these are the recommendations, right? And and, and the changes that happen in the ordinance would based on the recommendations. If these change it's not going to go into the ordinance until the commission approves those changes. Right? But it, it's actually going to impact multiple ordinances. So ordinance, what is it, 715? It's the, no, say it's it's the way longer longer ordinance. See what, what effect that yes. as a commission we actually change it? Yes. Before we go to the Yes. Sit down. <coughs> Did you want to say something? Well, I was just going to say, my recollection of Ms. Robertson request also that it might be retroactive. Uh, and I don't know if that has an effect on other accounts, if it was made retroactive. I'm, I'm, I'm reticent to do that yeah. um, because the utility followed city law to that point, right? And so um, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to open that door because... Uh, it looked like, to me, at the meeting that there was a a, a way for potentially going that way you know the vote might go that way so that's why i'm just bringing it up if it has an effect on other accounts you know making it retroactive and they may do it without y'all recommending that yeah, absolutely like, may. Yeah. but i mean at that point that would be a city council sure. decision but my my recommendation is not to make it retroactive okay. but I mean, if we followed if we followed city law, we followed city law. If the law wasn't right, then we could change that law, right? Which is what we're in the process of doing now. But I, I, I would I would be remiss to say that I would agree with making it retroactive. I'm sorry. I think that's a good idea. Myself. That's, that's, that's why I'm saying let's see the ordinance, which is the city law, and what changes we're gonna make to it. Yeah. When it go there, we don't have to work with whether they make it. There. We don't know what's going to vote it, because even if it go before them, this this can still go before them, and they can amend it to change something. Yeah. Want. So well, we want to make sure they, that they fully they understand. Making retroactive, obviously, regardless of what the count my commission recommends, and and I just think we'd be ready for that in case that yeah. that's all. I'm it to, to me, right? It, it would be you, that that would be a. I, I, like I said, it, it, if, if we did something wrong or we didn't follow the, the law or whatever, then, then we should make it retroactive all day long, right? But if we followed ordinance as it was written, you know, we, we did everything we were supposed to do, right? Now, if it's not if it's not the way that it should be, then we'll obviously change that. Well, I don't disagree with that. I think that's correct. But I'm just saying the yeah. possibility exists that that's No, I get it. You're exactly right. See, so you can do whatever they want, but... They, they won't listen to me on that if they want to do that. I'm just saying, you know, no, no matter what I say, I don't care if it's on the record. And again, and again, all we do is they don't really have to do it. Right. Don't put me some in on you, Mike. We want to go ahead and vote on these. I don't I don't think it's really a lot of clarity here, in my, in my opinion. 
I'll make a motion that we just table this until we can get some clarity of looking at that ordinance and seeing what changes we're sending to them. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Have a motion by Mr. Felton. Second by Mr. Smith to table this until the next meeting. And we've got the ordinance to present to us. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. Brown. Oh, yes. Have a, have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Yeah, a second. Oh, in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.